One of the main themes within this novel is the idea of dangerous knowledge. It reprimands the the excess and obsession of, of that pursuit, which seeks to go beyond what is necessary. Hello and welcome to Better Read Than Dead, the Generation Liberty book club show about all things narrative, literature and philosophy. On this week, we're going to be discussing the romantic masterpiece, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. And to discuss this book this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Generation Liberty coordinator and our favourite medical student, Pimica. Glad to be back on, Renee. Very, very excited for this book. It's one of the masterpieces of literature. I'm very excited to discuss it with you today. Yes, this is actually one of my favourites on the list and a really, really fascinating book. But Pimica, you first read this book when you were in high school. Yeah. Um, and now you've revisited it. Is it different reading it now that you've studied medicine for a couple of years? Well, I wouldn't say it's different per se, but it's definitely reinforced um, a lot of the themes that I did study during high school, and it's perhaps made it a touch more relatable. Now, doctors and scientists, they've gone on to do and create some amazing things, and in the medical field, we're all aiming to, to break boundaries and to do incredible things, but but something that's become a lot more apparent in medicine and certainly much more greatly acknowledged amongst medical professionals is the the really unhealthy consequence or consequences of an excessive pursuit of that knowledge, uh, which is often quite isolating. And in medical school, we hear of junior doctors who have become too immersed and almost lost themselves in in the grind per se, uh, and in seeking that perfection. And that's had quite serious consequences on their own mental health and in terms of their connection and increase their isolation. Uh, and we're taught about things like burnout and, and all of that in the medical field. And that, it is quite concerning, but it's definitely something which reminded me a lot of, of Victor's own um, journey that he traveled down um, in, in the book. Uh, there are also some themes about human vulnerabilities and human nature, specifically towards the end of life and leading in towards the end of life, uh, which were quite prominent um, in the book and also in my experiences in medical school and in the medical field. Uh, so I guess it's it's not necessarily made the, the book more different in my eyes, but it's gone from more abstract and conceptual themes to more relatable and it hits closer to home, I feel. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear, especially about, um, yeah, that the, the uh, medical students can go through similar kind of mental problems that Victor goes through in the book. Um, from my perspective, this book was really different from the first time I read it till now because, uh, and this seems like a dark thing to relate to it, I just had a, ch- I've had a child this year mm. and this is about the creation of life. Yeah. Mine's been very positive, but it really makes it hit home more that, um, the creation element and also the abandonment element of um, Frankenstein and that um, he just, he abandons the monster and that mm. seemed harsher to me in this reading than when I read it when I was younger. Um, but this novel out of all the books on our list is probably the one that has been adapted the most, um, has the most famous adaptions, but the adaptions are generally quite different to the book, um, mm. particularly I find the monster um, before reading the book when I was younger, my image of the monster was very different to when you go in and he's, he's so articulate and he speaks so fluently and he's almost more human. Why do you think that in the, the film adaptions and the, even some of the play adaptions, they make the monster mute or very, very limited in speech? Yeah, it's a good question, Renee. And I think there are a few ways we could look at this, but probably the most, I guess, telling for me would be, I think they're trying to dumb down the creature a bit um, because it makes it makes the creature more relatable, more comfortable and more palatable, I think, for a mainstream audience who's really grown accustomed to that typical antagonist, protagonist narratives. Um, so in trying to dumb down the creature essentially and, and really narrowing his perception, it deepens that protagonist antagonist dichotomy and that's quite unfortunate um because in my opinion the creature is something that's a lot more deeper than that there, there are a lot more nuance there uh and there isn't really that dichotomy that 
a lot of the movie adaptations or, or, or play adaptations are trying to show. It's a much deeper character and it's a shame that the creature is presented in that light, in my opinion. Yeah, I think it's also to make him a lot more sympathetic because I actually find the monster in the book, because he's articulate, is much scarier in some elements, but also because you hear his story, you have more sympathy for him in other ways. But I guess film can't really take the time to make him this articulate creature but then explain and get him back to you sympathising with him slightly. Um, I really don't think that maybe over that time you could do that. I think if he was this articulate monster on screen, I think everyone would just, you know, call him the monster. It would be too much. Like it would it's just be, he would just be much. the monster. Like and yeah. he, they can't have him sit there for an hour and tell his story on, like, during the film thing. But it's very interesting. And, and, and to make it mainstream as well, Renee, you can't have some, that much nuance or that much in-depth experience. A lot of the, you have to make it commercial, commercialisable. Um, and it's just having a really complex, deep creature which shows the deepest reflections of men, of humankind is just... Yeah, I think it's a bit too much for, for the mainstream audience necessarily to to, to take on board um, and it requires a bit more introspection than I think uh, a trip down to the movie uh, cinemas would, would would require, I guess. No, um, you know, we are living in the age now of the long-form TV mm. show, which is more like a pulled-out movie where we're getting these more complicated right. stories. So maybe Frankenstein is calling out for some Netflix miniseries I agree. where the monster can speak. I agree. That sounds exciting. <laughs> so um, one of the main themes within this novel is the idea of dangerous knowledge, and that kind of seems to be one of the real central ideas of this. And um, even Victor, he attributes all the tragic fate, is uh, all his tragedy in his life is because of his relentless pursuit of knowledge. Do you think that's truly the source of his suffering? And do you think that there is such thing as as dangerous knowledge? Yeah, well, maybe it's not the only cause of his suffering, but it's certainly a major factor. Um, but I think it's more specifically the unrestrained pursuit of knowledge, irrespective of what the consequences are, that I believe that really contributed towards the suffering. Um, and that's a dangerous knowledge, that unrestrained knowledge. Um, and it's, and don't get me wrong, it's knowledge that's what's driven humans to extreme heights. We think of all the great innovation that's come from the Enlightenment and especially in, in the past few decades. Uh, but the Romantic era critique of that, which is essentially the, the entire story of Frankenstein, it, it reprimands the, the excess and obsession of, of that pursuit, which seeks to go beyond what is necessary, beyond what's net beyond what's healthy and beyond what's really justified. Uh, and you could see contemporary examples of that in like in things like genetic testing uh, and using live human subjects for novel procedures to try and experiment and see what's right and see how far you could push the boundaries. And they do present quite challenging ethical conundrums, but I think that's what's really dangerous about it. The unrestrained pursuit, uh, which, is, which is blind to what's, what's just and humane, uh, I think is probably where it's at. I think you're right there. I think it's also kind of the selfish pursuit of mm. knowledge. There's no real, like, like he says, oh, maybe I can use this to, you know, help people who are dying. He mentions that. But more he emphasises um, that I'm creating a new species and they're all, I'm going to be like their god or is almost what he talks about. No other man could, you know, attribute, like have a child that's more, you know, I'm that's more responsible for it. So it's also the removing of the feminine, which I think is a re reoccurring theme, yeah. is um, why Victor suffers is because he meddles with things that he doesn't understand and he tries yeah. to take away the feminine aspects of life. And that also comes in with the idea of nature, which she continually attributes as feminine. That actually just, just reminded me of something, Renee. Do you know Jurassic Park? Um, and oh, Jurassic, yes. uh, more, more specifically, the second film in the Jurassic World series, when they were trying to breed that that new uh, dinosaur because it was apparently the everyday crowd they weren't interested in just normal dinosaurs. They wanted this new artificial uh, dinosaur which is spliced with genes from everything. And then they grew, they raised this dinosaur in complete captivity without a mother figure in its life to 
to be able to teach it what's right and what's wrong and how to interact with the world. So he was pretty much grew up blind and his only interaction with the world was, was when the humans gave him food in uh, the, the drop down food. Uh, so I think that that element of, of nurturing is important um, as well. And oh, that just reminded me straight away of that, that yeah, Jurassic World and Jurassic Park. So, yeah, it's a, I think it's an interesting theme that reoccurs um, and I can definitely see they're touching on it there is um, when men uh, underestimate the importance of females within mm. the world, then that's when things can get dangerous. But also can you think of any other modern examples where the pursuit of knowledge um, has had dangerous consequences, maybe even more recently? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think maybe in terms of the pursuit of knowledge, the nuclear research, I think, was probably one of them, um, especially during the wartime and that leading to the discovery of the atomic bomb uh, and, you know, the devastating consequences of that sad. Uh, but also perhaps even more recently, uh, over the past couple of decades, um, the the advent of social media um, and it, it, it's its pursuit and journey for more knowledge and information. Uh, and now we can see the devastating effect that it's had on, on everyday people, but especially young people as well, uh, and the consequences on their mental health. Uh, so I think the, thing, the important thing to note here is that it all started with good intentions, uh, but with a lack of self-awareness, and again, that excess, taking it to the, to the nth degree, uh, that's what leads to devastating consequences, because the intention was good, uh, but without that self-awareness, uh, you have the problems arising. I also um, think it's really interesting, though, that um, Mary Shelley kind of says she kind of makes the argument for both, um, yeah. as in that at the end when they're trying to turn the boat back to that he's, like, you know, the men won't die on the ship, Victor, like, loses his mind and is like, how, like, you know, you've got to push forward. Um, and I think she always kind of errs on showing both sides of the arguments and that she knows that also sometimes you do need to push knowledge a bit faster. Yeah. Even you know, the example of, of nuclear technology that has had had horrific events, but it's also used in some forms of medicine yeah. um, and even social media, it's had some horrific effects, but it also has some positives. So I think that really goes to, um, she's got a quote that says, I'm not a person of opinions because I feel counter arguments too strongly. And actually she's one of the writers within our series that reminds me a lot of the time of Dostoevsky because Dostoevsky yes. does not straw man. He puts up strong arguments for both sides. And I feel like she does that throughout this novel. It's not simplistic. She's not saying this is clearly the answer. She's saying this is a conundrum that all humanity faces and here are the bad things that can happen, but I understand that there's reasons that we do this as well. So it's she's really nuanced and interesting writer, I think, in that way. Absolutely. So another thing that's kind of reoccurring throughout the novel is sickness. Um, so mother, uh, Victor's mother dies early on after um, looking after Victor's cousin, who has scarlet fever. And then after Victor creates Frankenstein, he is also overcome with sickness. Um, do you think there's any symbolism here that um, Mary Shelley's trying to get in with reoccurring ideas of sickness? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think probably the major thing is that sickness is in itself humanity's frailings and weaknesses. It's, it's what makes humans imperfect uh, and always secondary to, to nature as a whole uh, in a bigger, bigger scheme of things. And I think the way that Shelley particularly portrayed sickness, especially after Victor sees the creature, he gets a bit sick and, and seeing the results of his, of his creation, he gets quite sick. It's almost as if, if Mary Shelley's trying to show some retribution for the crime of trying to beat nature. Like you, you see the creature uh, and it's, it, Victor suddenly realises what he's actually done and it reflects the sorry state of, of what he's created. Uh, and, and it really goes back to that idea about you can't ever really beat nature, that, that romantic ideal about nature's supreme. And if you try to try to do what it takes to try and cheat the system and overcome that, you will be reminded in quite quite serious fashion about how wrong you are in, in trying to achieve that. Yeah, no, I think you're really hitting the nail on the head there. The, also, I found the really interesting thing there was the, uh, the contrast with how Victor's mother deals with sickness and how he deals with sickness, mm. as in she, despite sickness, 
takes on the responsibility that she has to look after her child no matter the consequences. And that ends up in her dying, but she accepts that to save her child because, you know, she's, you know, truly loves this child. She doesn't want to abandon it. And then the contrast is Victor avoids responsibility um, be- almost because of his sickness as well. And those two kind of things tied together and that real contrast between what a real creator who loves, um, you know, and has, you know, a natural child has mm. and what this abomination was like, it's like this twisted two sides, which I thought was a really interesting contrast. So it reflects like the internal uh, perceptions of the, of what it means to be a, a nurturer as well. Uh, I think it's very true. Yeah. The other reoccurring theme, of course, within uh, Frankenstein, because it is a romantic novel, is nature. The monster itself is 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 an abomination against nature, but nature is really powerfully used to create mood. Um, How did you uh, find the descriptions of nature throughout the novel? Yeah, well, as I just just mentioned before, I, I think that Shelley suggests that the goodness in humankind rests in that romantic appreciation of nature and of one's raw emotions as opposed to the you know the intellect and the, the, that abstract thing that, of the enlightenment uh, and in doing so she presents a strong case for a resistance against those corruptive enlightenment ideals which go against nature and i think you can actually uh, it's the way that she's portrayed it is very very smart and intelligent because you can see that clash between the enlightenment and romantic ideals in the in the topography and the weather of Frankenstein, which are actually reflections of those conflicting value systems. Because on one front, we have Mont Blanc, which is a mountain near Geneva, and it's it, that succinctly encompasses that, that Gothic motif of the sublime, which for Victor, and I've got the quote written down here, it says, these sublime and magnific- magnificent scenes afforded one the greatest consolation. So nature is a consoling and calming presence and figure. Uh, And as is the case with humanity, there is a certain warmth and beauty of the natural world, which Shelley argues is being invaded by the storm and thunder of the enlightenment. And the lightning in particular is is a really, really potent symbol because that notion of lightning or, or electricity is essentially what what encompasses Frankenstein's artificial reanimation of the creature. Uh, you know, when you see it in all the movies and everything, when the creature comes to life, you have the lightning bolt striking, trying to pierce the natural natural world, um, and it shows that direct link between the monstrous and the enlightenment, which that lightning uh, reflects. So I think that's an interesting contrast there between the enlightenment values uh, that of the lightning. Uh, and the romantic values of, the, of nature and the natural and that battle that's going on almost entirely throughout the novel. Yeah, I think it's also really interesting that she, all, again, kind of balances that as well um, and and does show an, another argument because part of the romantic is also very focused on the individual and the individual's pursuits and the individual's passions. And nearly everything that goes wrong in the book is because... Um, Victor is is passionately pursuing his own individual means. So she once again is, you know, critical of uh, these new things that are coming in, but also sees that side of um, that we need logic um, as well, which she, yeah, she does that powerful balancing act throughout this whole novel, which it makes it even more um, impressive that how young she was when she wrote this. She was only... She was 18, was it? 21 yeah. or something? Yeah, she was, she was still yeah. a teenager. So, yeah, 18, wow. 19. So Incredible. That's, it's just amazing um, how much uh, depth is within this novel considering how young she was when she wrote it. Um, nature, as in human nature, which you've kind of touched on before, is also a reoccurring theme. And I think the idea of kind of nature versus nurture um, which is a question that's con- continuously asked um, still now, um, is evoked powerfully throughout the novel. Do you think that the monster was inherently bad or do you think he was a creation of his circumstances and how society reacted to it? Yeah, well, whilst a lot of what the, the monster did, Renee, was like quite inexcusable, killing that, that innocent boy, Tifa Monks, we can't excuse him for that. It was undoubtedly bad. 
but I don't think it was this intrinsic nature that was at fault there. We kind of touched on it earlier about that idea of nurturing, how important it is to have that guiding influence in your life, particularly early on. And I find that the deprivation of parenthood and guidance to the creature as having really been the prime cause of a loss of what had gone wrong with the creature. And whilst the experiences of the creature alone did allow it to like master language um, without any supervision, uh, the creature is deluded almost like humans into believing that the knowledge that he acquired has made him a master of the natural, that he's almost a god in a way because he's managed to, to do all these things and, and work everything out without being um, advised by people around him or a parental figure. And, and for all the good of natural philosophy, it will only really ever tell you, I guess, what is the case it would never be able to tell the creature what should be the case uh, and i think that's really the important point here um, in terms of the importance of nurturing uh, because without nurturing you can still gain an appreciation for what is but not necessarily what should be uh, so in, in that sense i think that the creature's circumstances is really a reflection of his, the societal rejection of him uh, of the creature uh, and and also that in itself is reflective of what humans have believed and they have done to to the world uh, and how they feel that they interact with the, the world as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. And like, especially when you when you look at um, the idea which is brought up in the book that that the world or nature is is the mother, which is the nurturer. Mother Earth. So yeah, yeah, it all comes back together um, and kind of connected to that. Um, a question which is, of course, asked um, whenever this book is read is, um, who is the real monster? Is Victor or or his monster more monstrous? And is which one of them is more human? But also connected to that, do you see lots of similarities also between them? Oh, yeah, there, there are undoubtedly so many similarities between, between Victor and the creature to the point in which I find that Shelley's actually manipulated the creature to exist as the doppelganger of Frankenstein, which is actually quite a common 19th century Gothic trope. Uh, and more specifically, when Frankenstein was actually developing the creature from the recep receptacle of bodies in the churchyard, I think that was how, how Shelley referred to it as, uh, she's insisting that it's not a new being that's being comprised of these recycled parts, um, but instead, I guess the repressed personality of mankind's deepest vulnerabilities is almost set free, uh, and that is inclusive of, of Victor as well. Uh, and also you have from the literal standpoint of this, again, this doppelganger motif, you have the manner in which um, the Frankenstein's limbs convulsed, uh, and that, that mirrors the description of also the creature's animation as well, uh, and it almost tethers the two characters or from the moments their parts converge because they are almost reflections of each other. Like you have the marionette puppets and, but instead of having one controlling the other, they both control um, the other. Uh, and yeah, the, the, I think that's, that's quite potent there as well. And I think Frankenstein describes the creature as his own vampire as well. Um, and I think that suggests that the creature is almost the repressed energies of Victor's psyche manifested in physical form, leeching off the blood supply of the other for sustenance. And so that's why I think that those two characters are so similar because they are reflections of each other. They share so many similarities. Um, and, and yeah, I think that's probably the most, most striking thing that I've found is, is that they're, they're so similar to the extent in which is in which if you were to take away their initial history, uh, they might be one and the same in the terms of how they interact with the world, particularly after the creature had developed, um, how, how he, um, how he interacts with society, how he interacts with other people, a lot of similarities between that and Victor himself. I saw it as very, um, evocative of Jungian kind of concepts of the shadow. Um, mm -hmm. and the shadow self. And one of the teachings within um, Jung is if you do not acknowledge your capability for evil um, and you do not embrace the shadow, then it will manifest itself somewhere. And because kind of Victor never faced, looked into the concept that maybe he shouldn't 
create life and maybe this could go badly and maybe I'm capable of creating not something beautiful but something monstrous, um, that's kind of the monster ends up being that manifestation of um, of his shadow that he hasn't mm. properly acknowledged and integrated into himself. So, and that um, is, yeah, as you said, very common, the Jungian kind of ideas of the shadow um, with books of this time um, uh, getting played with. We even saw it in, um, we've seen it, it worked in so many of the books we've come across the, um, during book club, like in Jane Eyre. Mm. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting to see that theme come up again and again and again. Um, but I think one of the real monsters in this book um, or one of the real challenges that both the monster and Frankenstein face is, is isolation. So both um, when it's thrust upon them and also when they kind of create their own um, isolation. So I, I would argue that isolation is probably one of the most destructive elements within the book. Um, what do you think? Absolutely. Well, I touched on it earlier. The thing with isolation is, is what it does is it, it takes away many of the barriers that otherwise would be preventing you from going down a certain pathway. You have your parents there to tell you, um, okay, maybe what you're doing is not right or it's not wrong. You have society there. You have laws in place to tell you what's right uh, and, and what's wrong and where, where you've crossed the line. In having isolation, you don't have those barriers there. There's nothing there to tell you, okay, you're not going down the right path. And in many ways, the, the, the journey that Victor went down necessitated him having that self-inflicted exile almost in Ingolstadt into that solitary chamber, uh, because if he didn't, he wouldn't have, he would have met those challenges which would have prevented him from going down that pathway. And that's what makes it so, so destructive. And I think he refers to uh, what he did uh, essentially in, in isolating himself as, uh, as escaping the dis domestic sphere, the domestic sphere, which he found, which he finds to be, uh, restrictive of his uh, of his journey uh, down into into essentially what became chaos and destruction, uh, and that domestic sphere includes that uh, the female um, influence in Victor's journey. He, he lacks that completely, really, when he when he isolates himself. And I find that to be an important part of any person's life, let alone a mad scientist um, that Victor turns up into. Uh, so that's really the main point here with isolation. It, isolation gets rid of that mediatory influence of the domestic sphere. It makes one obsessed with following the, the, the that one goal that they're focused on and nothing else. And that, that monomaniacal pursuit is really what's to blame, I think, for a lot of Victor's downfall. Yeah, and I also think um, one of the problems with isolation is it kind of um, perpetuates itself and can become a vicious cycle, which I think was what the monster goes through. He's isolated, so he lashes out, and that means that he becomes even more isolated because he becomes more of the monster that makes him isolated in the first place. Um, so I think that that destructive cycle is um, mirrored between both of them. And I think a lot of people would find this book a really interesting um, read right now um, because I think lots of us have gone through a period of isolation over the last couple of years. Um, and to see that idea and concept played with, um, much like, you know, Metamorphosis was an interesting mm -hmm. read right now, um, which also dealt with the idea of isolation. Um, and those two definitely have some similarities there. Um, okay, so now we're coming towards the end of the show. Before we move on to more broad recommendations, I'd like to know if you have a favourite adaption of Frankenstein. Well, I am I like to stay true to the novel, Renee, um, and I really believe in having the, the genuine experience of that novel. So in that case, I think probably the adaptation that's most true to the novel uh, will be 1994, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the one with Robert De Niro as the creature and Kenneth Branagh as Victor. Um, I, I think it really encapsulates the key themes of the book and does the best job at trying to express Mary Shelley's message uh, and the themes that she was trying to express. So I'd stay true to that adaptation, even though it's not perfect. I think that's probably the best one in my opinion. Uh, I, I'm going to go with um, the original film or the first, one of the first film adaptations and say I really um, still love the 1931 version, um, yeah. not only as a, an adaption of Frankenstein, but also just a really 
powerful piece of early film. Um, that's very, very interesting and beautifully shot and uh, I think a must watch. Um, but now I'll move on to more broad recommendations. Um, if our viewers enjoyed Frankenstein, is there any other books, mm. movies or art that you would recommend? Well, I'm going to see Spider-Man tonight, Renee, the, the new one that's coming into cinemas, but there is the opposite of Spider-Man, Venom, which I think is a very interesting uh, movie to watch, especially in the contemporary context. It talks about a symbiote, which essentially takes over a human's body and you have these two, the, the symbiote, the creature, uh, living inside a human and it shows the that dichotomy um that i was talking about earlier uh and it has the protagonist antagonist boundaries being almost completely crossed it's not not even there they're, they're, they're one and the same the protagonist and antagonist in venom and i think it's very interesting how marvel and sony explore that character especially in the recent films and i would highly recommend that um but also uh, this is more regarding the themes of Frankenstein and trying to explore humanity's deepest vulnerabilities, but I would recommend Squid Game as well on Netflix, the, the blockbuster uh, Netflix series. Uh, yeah, it, it has a lot of themes there, especially human frailties and human nature uh, and the importance of having that in, in one, having human nurture in one's life. Um, I think it's, it's a good, good option to explore as well. Some very good recommendations there. Personally, my recommendation would be, the, if you enjoyed this, um, the 1986 film The Fly with Jeff Goldblum. Um, he doesn't create a monster there, he becomes the monster, but I think it definitely touches on very similar themes of um, going too far with science and, and dangerous knowledge. Um, and also, who doesn't want to watch a film with Jeff Goldblum? He's just awesome there's not enough jeff goldblum in the world in my opinion um but thank you so much for your time today pimica it was a wonderful discussion can you let our audience know how to get involved with book club if they are not involved already absolutely well to join better ed than dead go to generationlibacy.org.au and click on the book club link there'll also be a link below in the description of this show you'll get Lots of great freebies such as books, stickers and other merchandise as well. And membership is free for Generation Liberty members and only $10 for others. So please join. Yes, please get involved if you're not a member already. We still have books to give away and we still have some books coming up. And also all our, our episode, previous episodes are available for you to watch um, on our YouTube channel. But for now, make sure that you follow us on Instagram and join us next time. But thank you for listening and I hope you keep reading. Bye.